Marai gin dema rada rukun oroyo ri arba bang pawa gin ti arba loho lam pawa gin ri masa yam. Megin baro yo kai gin ngaro ti ri arba ngang ri. Nigi rumi ri anai mana mi kodo loa nyo nai ma adu aji. Hai ra gin doro gin ra aji gin sana nai rado gin dodo. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to please welcome Power Africa Partnerships as a Source of Power panel to the stage, moderated by Lee Zak, Director of the U.S. Trade and Development Agency. Thank you very much. Wow, what an amazing day! And I have to say, I am so excited about this panel because I think it is one of the most important, one of the most innovative, and one of the most exciting initiatives of this administration, Power Africa. Being able to moderate this panel today is very meaningful to me because I was with President Obama when he launched the initiative on the continent. And when he launched that initiative, he asked us to focus on something that was very important. And that was to encourage economic growth in Africa through bringing access to power. Because only two out of three people on the continent had access to power. So what does that mean? What does that look like? Oftentimes when people talk about what it means to have access to power in Africa, they show a diagram of the continent. And they show the light pollution and the fact that there isn't a lot of light pollution in Africa. And sometimes they talk about how dark it is when one flies over the continent. But I'd like us to just stop for a minute and not think about what it means from the air, but what does it mean on the ground? From my travels in Africa, from what I've seen, access to power in Africa means that a girl in Ghana cannot complete her homework after sunset. It means that a doctor in Rwanda can barely keep the lights on, never mind use sophisticated medical equipment. It means that an entrepreneur in Mali is unable to grow her small business. What it means is that engines of growth, such as education, healthcare, and business, can't quite get started in the way that they should in Africa. 
So access to power in Africa affects real people. And that's why President Obama has asked us to deliver real outcomes. And that's what we're here to talk about today. And that's what Power Africa is about. Power Africa, with its partners, and actually it numbers almost 120 partners today, are working to add 30,000 megawatts of power and to provide 60 million connections by 2023. OK, so the real question everybody has is, how are we going to do that? Well, there are three things that we're focusing on to be able to do that. The first is one that you've heard a lot about throughout today, and that's partnerships. And that's a very important part of Power Africa. As I mentioned already, there are over 120 partners for Power Africa. And this ranges along a, a range of parties. First of all, the US government is a very significant partner. And frankly, partnership begins at home. It was mentioned this morning that the US government is working hand in hand. And I have to say, I've been in the private sector. I've been in public sector. I have never seen people collaborating and working together the way that they are for Power Africa. And I don't mean people are just you know, putting in their notes for a report. What I mean is when there is a project that needs to move forward, we're picking up the phone. We're calling each other. We're trying to figure out what needs to be done. And this is something that is extremely important, this level of collaboration among the US government. But clearly, we know, we know that's not the answer alone. And there are very other important partners as well. Clearly, our African partners are key. And working with them, we have been able to sort of change how business is being done. It's focusing on specific policies and opening up markets. We've also, as we heard this morning on the finance panel, working with the international finance institutions, like the World Bank, the AFDB. So these are important players as well. We're working with foreign governments. We're not only working with the United States, but we're working with Sweden, we're working with the UK, we're working with Canada, and we're also working with multilateral institutions, such as C4ALL and NEPED, and I'm very excited to have Rachel um, with us here today, and she's gonna be telling us more about the exciting work that they're doing. The other thing that we're doing differently in Power Africa is that we're focusing on transactions. And this is very important because through the transactions, we're able to gain focus. We're able to see what changes may need to be made so we can focus on policy. We're able to drive results. And I think a discussion that's gonna come up a little later is when you drive those results, you also drive more people to come. And so that's why the transaction focus has been so important. And I very much look forward to Neb's discussion um, as we continue throughout the panel, because he is the lead transaction advisor in Ethiopia, and he's been doing tremendous things in this area, and we're gonna hear more about that shortly. In the last piece, um, and frankly, those of you who know me, it's one near and dear to my heart, is that we've been focusing on the private sector and bringing the private sector as a solution, as a partner, as a change agent for Power Africa. We heard earlier today in the discussion with respect to finance how important the private sector is to catalyzing capital. But the private sector is also extremely important as a partner for the development. And that's why I'm so delighted that we have um, Joe here today, um, who is going to be talking about his projects and what he's been doing with Contour Global. So for the next time that we have available, the next 30 minutes or so, we're gonna have a discussion about what's happening with respect to Power Africa. We're gonna be talking about what it has meant to people, what the challenges are, and where we think we're going in the future. And to begin that discussion, I'm going to turn to Rachel. Um, and Rachel Kite is the CEO of the UN Sustainable Energy for All Initiative, which focuses on affordable, reliable, and sustainable energy as a key to combating both poverty and climate change. 
we had a chance to have a little discussion before we came on uh, the stage. Um, Rachel has an amazing background, and she is really well suited to talk to us about this concept of partnership. What is so important about partnership, and why is it making a difference in Power Africa? Well, thank you very much, and I'm delighted to be here. And uh, in preparing for this panel, uh, and as a British citizen, which is where we understate things, I was encouraged to um, uh, pay you full compliment as the United States of America for your leadership. So coming from well me... Well done. You, <laughs> coming from me, you can relax and know that it's for real. But... Um, uh, Secretary of Clinton said when she was Secretary of State that the United States was the necessary nation. And that's true when it comes to sustainable development. You don't get a deal in Paris on global climate change without the United States or without its leadership. You don't get deals on sustainable development goals in the United Nations without the United States preparing to show its leadership. And when the president threw down you know, a challenge to the world, which is really what Power Africa was, it was a necessary piece of leadership. Now, the good news is that the rest of the world agrees. And I think on the sort of supply side of the support necessary to African leaders and to African people to get the, con get the continent uh, powered and electrified and working. Um, there is a coordination and an agreement now that wouldn't have been possible really perhaps with Power Africa urging people on. So the United Kingdom, the European Union, uh, the French, uh, all of the other development partners for African nations are lined up and pointed in the same direction. That was not true five, 10 years ago. At the same time, Africa, led in the acceptance and agreement of sustainable development goals, one of which is basically taking Power Africa and even adding something to it. The idea that every African can have access to cheap, affordable power by 2030, that we'll have a revolution in efficiency, and that we will completely change the mix of energy in the energy system with much more renewables. Right, that's, that wasn't possible without African leadership, and African leadership was important in getting the climate deal as well. And then, of course, civil society, new business models, the drop in the price of technology and renewables. Suddenly, those goals are not they're, not, they're not goals that are sort of far out there. This is deliverable. This is executable. And it is possible within the next 10, 15 years. And so what I think was important about this partnership is having the vision, having the guts to sort of put a line down and say, that's where we're going to, and then being able to galvanize from the bottom up and the top down the kind of coordination that's necessary. What's the challenge now is choreography. There's money out there, but it's not in the right place at the right time under the right terms. There is incredible innovation in the marketplace, but perhaps not understood or known by those who are sitting in the Ministry of Energy. And it's a, the ability to be able to imagine what success will look like. We can talk about what isn't there today, but can you imagine what it will mean in 15 years if you are in a small town in central West Africa and the lights are on and you can have an operation and you could have gone to the capital city and trained to be a nurse and you came back and you have a job in your own community and you're successful and you save people's lives because there's power? Can you imagine all the businesses that your family members will be running because there's power? businesses that they perhaps imagined but never thought that they could run or own. That's what's transformative. And now the challenge is to get African leaders, parliamentarians, judges, elected leaders, business leaders, to know that this is actually possible in 10, 15 years. So the final challenge for the United States of America is that these are not short-term things. This is, this is making a commitment to the continent for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. This is a generational thing. And so the consistency of policy and commitment is absolutely necessary. But I think with the Sustainable Development Goals, we have a 15-year agenda, and we need the US leadership for the next 15 years as well. Neb, you're here. Neb, this is a perfect segue into the types of things that you're doing. And we're delighted to have Neb Gurma here with us, who is the lead transaction advisor for Power Africa in Ethiopia. And this concept of being on the ground is so important, sort of the reforms that are being talked about, getting people to understand what's important to make changes, exactly what you're doing. Can you tell us a little more about it? Absolutely. Uh, first, I want to thank um, everyone for the opportunity uh, that we're given to uh, speak about what we're doing on the ground, as you, as you see it. So uh, when I arrived in Ethiopia, this was in uh, 
sometime in 2013, right after the, uh, the president announced uh, the Power Africa Initiative in Tanzania, um, there was not a single transaction, uh, private sector transaction that has been uh, you know, performed or conducted in Ethiopia, in the history of Ethiopia, per se. So one of the things that the government had decided is, is that because that region is very rich in geothermal, uh, and they did have a lot of issues with their hydro because uh, you know, Ethiopia in particular is a drought prone uh, region, region, and their economy is really built on hydro. Uh, they were really suffering from uh, you know, uh, rainfall and, and what have you, and so they were not meeting uh, expectations, not only on the food side, but even on the energy side. So they had this initiative that they wanted to develop the other resource, that they had, the other enormous resource that they have, which is geothermal. Uh, but the challenge was that there, were, there was no geothermal uh, proclamation, a law, or legal framework to do that. Uh, but they wanted to interact or to engage in a, a bilateral deal with a, a, an Icelandic uh, a firm uh, called Reykjavik. And uh, the discussions took very long. Uh, just for the fact that they, were, you know, they don't know about this deal. So there was a, a lot of times in, in what we call the um, discussion sessions and what have you, uh, I happened to speak a lot more than I wanted to speak uh, rather than them speaking and, and initiating. And, and, and the thing is, is that naturally uh, Ethiopians are also a little bit shy and, and kind of expressing themselves. They wanted to gauge you first and what your motives are and what have you. So uh, even myself, you know, I'm, I'm an Ethiopian American, but I have been away for such a long time coming back and try to tell them I think this way is better than this way, you know, like, you know, hold on, you know, <laughs> who are you to tell us? So uh, we, we uh, you know, we moved uh, uh, away from the hurdle and, and I think the trust start building at that, at that moment and uh, that they knew that uh, I have their best interest at heart and, and trying to help them. So. From that aspect of it, uh, a, there was, as I said, there was a lot of hand-holding that needs to be done. And uh, eventually, you will find some bright people in there, one or two, you know, and, uh, and these institutions that they have, um, which need to be supported significantly. And uh, we found someone in the Ministry of Finance that really understood this, but this did not have the, back, the uh, power background. Uh, did not take long for us to actually bring him here and bring him up to speed. Uh, they're resistant to new ideas. Uh, uh, you know, a small example is, is uh, some of the risk mitigation facilities that we are uh, you know, proposing to them was like, no, no, we're not interested in this. We don't know it. Uh, we'd rather do uh, you know, some other mechanism and things of that sort. But eventually they, they warmed up. What we did is uh, through our bilateral uh, you know, uh, engagement, uh, we sent them out here for a crash course and how we will help them in actually developing this resource and other resources and, 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 and as such, when they come back, actually they became the advocate of, of these instruments, which, which is very transforming. So uh, what we have done so far is uh, really we, um, uh, with the help of, uh, uh, United States Energy Association, uh, we were able to uh, put together the geothermal proclamation, mm -hmm. which is in front of the Council of Ministers, not to be signed in the next probably few weeks. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, and then while we're doing that, uh, and collaboration, collaborating with the IFC, we're actually developing the geothermal uh, legal framework so that you know, developments will, 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 will go on, and that's in the final stages also, uh, which possibly be, be ratified within a couple of months. Um, we also looked at the energy uh, proclamation that they had, 2013, 18, that's what they called it. Um, and we found there were some clauses within that uh, uh, energy proclamation that was uh, not private sector in investment conducive. So we went ahead and, and tried to mitigate those things. Mm -hmm. And we asked if we can amend uh, that proclamation, which uh, the, the government was willing to do that. Again, all these things happened because we, uh, got, we were able to win the trust of the government uh, through the work that we're doing. So you know, a, a lot of things are, are, are being done uh, and things are changing in the right direction. 
And as I said, I'm cautiously optimistic about what's coming forward. That's great. Well, I had a chance to talk to Joe before we came on the panel, and he seems to be extremely optimistic uh, and has done a phenomenal job. And we're delighted to have with us Joe Brandt, who's the CEO and president of Contour Global, and um, has not only been optimistic, but very successful in Africa. And Joe, I'm curious. I mean, we've had a good discussion about partnerships, building trust, having reform. Um, how does that all fit in to you as a business person? What does that mean? And can you tell us about this phenomenal project you have in Senegal? Well, we, you, we, we've been doing you know, Power Africa in Sub-Saharan Africa before capital letters PA and after capital letters PA. And the landscape has been transformed in terms of policy, in terms of enabling investment, in terms of mobilizing capital, which is ultimately a critical constraint when we talk about bringing electricity to Africa because these are highly capital intensive industries. And you know, the, the, the Power Africa initiative was a bold one, it was foundational. And I think about projects that we did before Power Africa and after Power Africa that had a lot of similarities. We did one in Togo with uh, OPIC as our financier back in, in 2010. Um, we, we took about four and a half years to get that project moving forward, and it was, it was tough. It was tough to bring equity investors into the project to, to get them comfortable that this was a good idea. It was tough to get OPIC to think that, you know, being the first big power project in a West African state was a good risk profile for them, even though they're an enabling institution uh, as a development finance institution. And, and then I think, I fast forward to, to 2014, when we uh, signed with the government of Senegal, sub, uh, sub-Saharan African state, uh, West African sub-region, uh, same technology as we used in Togo, same lender that we used in Togo, same equipment and, and providers that we used in Togo. And, th and that project took 16 months to go from an idea to power on, onto the grid. And, and I looked at the, the way that we were able to generate support from particularly U.S. government agencies and the embassies. You know, the embassies have always been helpful in the past. The embassy was always there to help. But it wasn't, helping a power developer bring a power project into an African country wasn't on the top of the agenda. It wasn't the top three. After Power Africa, the symbolism and the symbolic communication of Tower Afri Power Africa, you, you got a, a, a very large administrative function that was suddenly very interested in what's a megawatt, and how do I bring megawatts into the country where I serve? And if someone happens to walk into my office and is talking about electricity in Africa, I'm going to figure out a way to get this project done. And we had tremendous assistance from state, from uh, the embassy in Senegal, and, and we brought our partners, OPIC and the IFC. And it, it, was a, it, was a, it was a project that was able to move with that type of speed in large part because we, we had a new landscape for developing power infrastructure uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's Power Africa. It's certainly President Maki Sall's uh, embrace of uh, a new way of doing uh, business and governing in, in, in that important country in, in West Africa. But watching these two things come together, it was not coincidental that we signed the, the agreement in August 14, just before or just during the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit, right? The, the President uh, uh, of Senegal um, made it clear to his team that he wanted this to be signed during that week. And he paid attention to that project from the beginning. He was with us when we inaugurated uh, just a month ago. And as a follow-on to that project, we're going to bring another 33 megawatts. So we're talking 100,000 people will benefit from, from this project, 150 million euro project, 100 million euro financing from OPIC. And that project will come online in nine months. And it's unheard of in, in, in our field to bring power, to bring energy, electricity onto grids this quickly. And it's changed a lot since, since 2013 and, and the announcement uh, in Dar es Salaam when the president announced the Power Africa initiative. What I'm hearing is that sort of creating this landscape has really made a difference. It's really bringing uh, new partners to the table, and it's bringing comfort for business, and it's bringing speed. Um, and I have to say, I say that very cautiously, because I know how long it takes for power projects to move forward. 
but what I'm hearing is it's taking less time than it did in the past. Um, we were talking earlier about the fact that we all love transaction, we love power, we can get a little geeky, um, but this is all about the people as well. And I'm gonna stay with you for a minute, Joe, because you are doing a really innovative project um, in Lake Kivu, and it has a really significant impact on people as well. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that one. Well, this is a unique one. Um, you know, rarely do you have the alignment of the science, the industry, or the private interest, the state and the, and the civil society around an extractive project. I don't, I've never seen it in my career, <laughs> and I'm unlikely to see it again. Mm -hmm. But Lake Kivu, which is on the border of Rwanda and Congo, uh, sometimes is, is, is termed a killer lake. Uh, but it's, it's a very unusual lake because it contains within uh, the waters, not beneath the surface of the lake, uh, dissolved mes methane gas in solution. And this methane gas continues to replenish itself through the, the um, decomposition of organic material in this deep water lake. It's about 500 uh, meters deep. Um, and it, it, it provides the benefit of, if you can extract it and separate the gas out of the water, you can use it for, for power production, which is desperately needed in Rwanda, which has an electrification rate of about 15%. But it's also a toxic menace because the release of the associated carbon dioxide, methane, and hydrogen sulfide will kill millions of people in this densely inhabited part of Central Africa on the lake of, um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda. And there's been a release uh, from uh, a similar lake in Cameroon that killed virtually everyone living on the lake in a sparsely inhabited part of Cameroon. Uh, we, over a very long period of time, about eight and a half years, uh, successfully figured out a way to tap that methane gas, uh, to, to extract it and bring it ashore, and are now generating for uh, the government and the, and the people of Rwanda uh, electricity, and are adding to uh, that extractive um, capability so that we're generating at the same time electricity and then reducing the buildup of, of, of the gas and the, and the gases in the lake. It's a, it's a very, very unusual project. Um, it's, a, it's a tribute to the company that I run and also the, the leadership of President Kagame, who saw this project as something that could do well um, at a time when a lot of people thought, let's just flare the gas because you can at least reduce the, 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 the toxic gas risk to the people living on shore but of course it would be a complete waste of, of a very productive energy resource in a country that desperately needs it. And it will, that, that project is now transforming the country and the president, uh, President Kagame was with us for the inauguration just two months ago. Uh, and there'll be more and more of this energy, a very unique form of renewable energy that will be made available to the country. And uh, it's a success story by, by any measure. It's just amazing to see something that was a potential hazard um, that is now being transformed through unbelievable technology and innovation into energy and basically doing good. Another area where I think there's been transformation is in the off-grid space. And Rachel, I was wondering if you could talk, tell us a little bit of, about what C4ALL has been doing in the off-grid, off space, and sort of how you see that as part of the Power Africa partnership and leadership. Well, perhaps we could stay in the same part of the world. I've actually been up the test uh, well uh, of this project, uh, I think, more than eight, nine years ago, um, uh, at, the, at a time when people thought this was crazy. But, you know, that's the length it, it of time. It was crazy. Yeah, that's the length of time <laughs> it, it takes to see it's these working. projects come into fruition. Um, and I was at IFC at the time, and certainly the management of IFC thought it was crazy. But... Um, but the point is that for East Africa, there's going to be methane. There's going to be uh, efficient hydro uh, evacuated out of Ethiopia into an East, Al East African power grid. There is geothermal. There's going to be uh, offshore gas. There is going to be uh, wind and solar grid connected. And then there is, in the short run, an opportunity by embracing distributed energy, mini grids, micro grids, home-based solutions. There is an opportunity not to wait for the grid to finally arrive at that distant rural community 
or for the people living in the informal settlements of the large and growing cities to be the last to have to sort of jerry-rig their way into the supply. There is a way now by embracing the new business models to actually bring that access forward in the next three, four, five years, not waiting 13, 15. And the economic, the economic uh, rationale for doing that, the economic empowerment that comes from having access to cheap, affordable, reliable electricity sooner rather than later is a number that we hope that in partnership with the US and everybody else, you put that number in front of ministers and perhaps you get their attention. So the distributed solutions alongside the grid can bring the social transformation, the leave no one behind that we all committed to in the United Nations last year, make that a reality. And what you see are these new business models, pay as you go on your cell phone, allowing you to use a home-based a home solar solution, uh, access to mini grids in Tanzania. And what Power Africa is doing together with all of the other partners is helping ministers and helping government realize that by embracing something which is new, there's no, there's no trodden path for embracing distributed energy the way that Africa will have to do it, that you can actually bring the solutions f f forward. And that this is, this is a good investment. There are impact investors in this country. There are equity investors in this country, West Coast and East Coast, philanthropies in this country, West Coast and East Coast, in Europe, interested in and beginning to buy into not only aggregators who can then work with very small businesses across Tanzania, Kenya, et cetera, but actually um, produce the evidence of the demand and show that the returns are there and introduce a whole new pool of capital to a very real and pressing need and show that those business models are actually succeeding. So for, who would have thought that you could, in 2016, be a West Coast investor, equity investor, and be able to invest in an aggregator with a small office in Arusha that has got 100 small um, uh, enterprises providing solar solutions for families and small businesses, and that you can make a return on that. But that's happening today, and that only happens when everybody has got the patience and partnership that helps governments see that that is a vision that they should embrace and helps the businesses and the finance find each other. Now, patience and partnership. <laughs> um, those are important things and things you face every day because one of the things you do are you bring all the tools together to make right. this a reality. Correct. Much of what Rachel is talking about. Tell us about some of the tools, some of the US government tools, other tools that are now being applied um, to Power Africa. So, um, you know, when we actually looked at wanting to help the government of Ethiopia uh, in executing their first transaction, which is the Corbeti uh, geothermal uh, transaction, uh, what we looked at is, is what is it, uh, you know, as far Africa that we can do, uh, primarily technical assistance and what have you under, under that umbrella. So one of the things that we did is, is we actually went and, uh, uh, you know, communicated with the African Legal Support Facility, which is a partner in the Power Africa Initiative, and requested for legal assistance, which, uh, when I first asked if they have any legal advisors within the country that actually done this kind of a deal, they gave me the, the legal advisor from the utility. And, and the guy is very junior. He doesn't even know how these deals are done. So what we had done is, is we actually interacted with the African Legal Support Facility and was, uh, we were able to actually uh, uh, capture uh, and get a, a, a premier uh, you know, legal firm, Clifford Chance. So that, that actually helped the government to be an equal footing with the sponsors to be able to negotiate in this. So that's one of the tools that we have. I, I can name a number of tools. Uh, what I would like to actually add is, is like the, uh, the PAT, Power Africa Transaction Advisor tool that you have on your app. It's an application that you can actually download. There's a, a, a lot of challenge in getting information from, you know, the, 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 you know, the governments of uh, East Africa, uh, particularly Ethiopia. So if you go there and, 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 and downloading the transactions that you see in there are in real time, really what we're doing in those transactions, that information would not have been done you know, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. But now you have it on the palms of your hand and things that are really transforming. So there's a huge change, a, a lot of application uh, uh, technologies that we're using, a lot of um, uh, 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 tools that we have with the, the 14 uh, U.S. government agencies that, that we have, USDDA, your, your organization, one of the ones that we are uh, very grateful about, you know, providing a 
$1,000 grant and uh, getting a, a procurement advisor for uh, the utility. Uh, these are things that they never had before. Now that they see that these are available through Power Africa, I mean, the government is really opening their, their, their uh, uh, minds to really get uh, as much assistance as they can to transform their uh, uh, sector. I mean, this type of support is, is, is critical given how finance intensive and document intensive these transactions are. I mean, you, you, you sometimes feel as if you are imposing a tremendous burden on the capacity of the ministries of energy and the local utilities because yep. the, these things get done after 17,000 pages of fine print are you know, negotiated. And, and in many African countries, particularly West Africa, the tradition of, of uh, immunity from government decisions doesn't exist and there's actually criminal liability that associates with making a bad business judgment. And so there's a, there's a, there's a hesitancy to really embrace something that is so foreign as, call it the Anglo-American way of financing power projects. And what USAID is doing now with this legal support facility is critical because a lot of times what stops that first step is a government or a minister or his team thinking this is going to be an extremely complex, extremely difficult uh, transaction to undertake legally in a, in a law that we're not familiar with because the, these transactions tend all to be done in, in foreign law. And how are we going to go about orienting ourselves to what it really means to do a transaction like this? Yeah, Power Africa through this USAID legal support facility seems esoteric, but it actually solves a very practical yeah. problem, which yeah. is how do you get a minister and, a, and a, a, a government that will have liability for decisions they make comfortable doing something they've never done before? And just linked to that, you know, we were talking backstage that, you know, good news doesn't travel as fast as bad news anywhere in the world, right? Um, and, you know, building the confidence of... of so these are all the, 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 the jigsaw pieces of building the confidence to do the things that need to be done and to do them, you know, on Monday morning. So the legal service is really important. Knowing that your neighbouring country or the neighbouring city or another jurisdiction close by has managed to achieve success by doing X, Y, Z, understanding what it took, whether it was a delivery unit in the president's office or whether it was a unit in the ministry, you know, how you work intergovernmentally. This is, you know, dull stuff, right? But fundamental and building the capacity to support institutions to be built. These are not the institutions of the past. The power system of Africa is not going to be something that's recognizable by driving across the United States and looking or going to Europe and seeing what we've got, right? This is going to be a very different system, integrated, uh, off-grid, uh, grid connected. It's going to be the woman with the cook stove. It's going to be the state-of-the-art geothermal network. And for a minister to be able to have the confidence to lay that vision out and then act on it means that good news has to travel fast. That's part of the job of Power Africa. And all of these boring bits of good government have to be connected. Well, it's sounding like one of the things that is really working is the fact that we have these partnerships. They're working closely together, that we're working very closely with our partners um, in the host country. Um, we're able to move projects and transactions more quickly and have more innovative um, projects. Um, I'm looking at our time, as you might guess. Um, we're on a tight leash up here, so I'm watching our time um, for our next guest. Um, but I'm just going to ask Joe very quickly, um, with all this in your background, what would you tell another CEO about investing in Africa? Well, the first, uh, I would tell them to go there. Um, and, and I... I, I <laughs> here, here. And, and I would tell them to go there because I know how much CEOs worry about raising capital, allocating capital, and, and doing well by the capital they raise. And I had an investor once tell me, look, who, who understand infrastructure and power very well and had spent a career investing in inf infrastructure. The investor told me, look, I'd rather lose money on a toll road in California than make money on a power project in Africa that's in the headlines every day for the wrong reasons and gets me called into my boss's office saying, what the hell are we doing in that country? And so changing that mindset is going to be what has to happen to mobilize the capital. The infrastructure as an asset class is extremely well known, and it's, it's the way governments everywhere, including in the OECD countries, are financing their infrastructure. They're doing it through things that look like public-private partnerships, things that look like 
uh, private sector-led initiatives, and there are, you know, the pension funds and the insurance companies of everyone in this room are invested in power plants and toll roads and bridges in OECD countries. And we need to move that money and that interest into Sub-Saharan Africa. And the way to do it is to go there and realize this is a good place to be. If you're an American investor, it may be one of the few places on the planet where you're actually welcome. It's a, it's a, it's a place that has a very positive orientation towards the United States. And the risk-adjusted returns for the capital are higher than they would be in a developed country. And this is what investors look for, high risk-adjusted returns. And if we talk about the successes and we talk about the investors like mine who took a chance early when the idea of investing in Africa power was not an accepted idea and we show the success that's been created, then I think we start down that path of mobilizing the capital. And that's what we need to do. So as we start to wrap up, um, what we're hearing is the fact that Power Africa is a success. We have many successes under our, bill, uh, under our belt. As a matter of fact, um, more than 29,000 megawatts are currently being supported by Power Africa, and 4,600 of those are already at financial close. And this is important, not only because of those numbers, but I think what each one of this panelists said is that success begets success, that it creates a momentum, and we have a momentum going now. I think the other thing that is very exciting is the fact that in addition to the support from the administration, there's been significant support from Congress as well with the Electrify Africa Act. So this is something that will institutionalize Power Africa and bring it into the future. And I think the final thing is the fact that we see that through the partnership, through the trust, through the transactions, through business, we are powering Africa. And what that means, it means that a girl will be able to do her homework, a doctor will be able to treat his patient, and a small business will become a big one. Thank you very much, and please, let's thank our outstanding panelists. Well done. Right on time.